Hello, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of endocrine physi physiology, and this is recording part five. Diabetes mellitus is usually categorized as type one or type two. Type one diabetes is due to a deficiency of insulin production, most commonly due to autoimmune destruction of pancreatic beta cells. Since this often occurs during childhood or adolescence, it used to be called juvenile diabetes. These patients will die without insulin treatment because they cannot transport glucose into their cells. Patients with type 1 diabetes are at risk for diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, if they don't receive insulin treatment. Why is this? In the absence of glucose being transported into the cells, the body will start to break down fatty acids for nutrition. They also become dehydrated due to osmotic diuresis from the hyperglycemia, and they develop nausea and vomiting. The breakdown of fatty acids, or lipolysis, leads to ketosis. Now, in normal patients, even tiny amounts of insulin will prevent life-threatening amounts of ketoacidosis. For example, patients on a very, very low-carb diet will go into ketosis, but not ketoacidosis. Even type 2 diabetic patients don't usually get diabetic ketoacidosis unless they have another precipitating event like an infection or sepsis. Once again, the ketones that are formed are acetoacetate, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And diabetic ketoacidosis is one of the anion gap metabolic acidosis conditions. In mule packs, I believe it's the K for ketoacids. In mud piles, it's the D for diabetic. In patients with DKA, the degree of hyperglycemia does not necessarily correlate with the severity of the acidosis. Most patients in DKA have a sugar in the 3 to 500 le level. These patients become profoundly dehydrated, often 4 to 10 liters of fluid may be needed. And this is due to osmotic diuresis as well as nausea and vomiting. Other signs may be leukocytosis, abdominal pain, and ileus. We treat these patients with fluid resuscitation, correcting electrolytes, and administering insulin, usually about 10 to 20 units are necessary. When the blood glucose drops below 250, we start to add glucose as well in order to avoid hyper, hypoglycemia. We also need to replete the patient's potassium. These patients may present with hyperkalemia, but remember that their total body potassium stores may be quite depleted. They haven't had insulin, so they haven't been able to transport potassium into the cells. We should also maintain adequate urine output. You should be aware that when patients are very hyperglycemic, we need to correct sodium. For every 100 milligrams per deciliter of blood glucose over 100, we have to add one and a half to two milliequivalents per deciliter to their sodium in order to correct. Patients may also need bicarbonate, although this isn't routine because we don't want to worsen their intracellular acidosis. Bicarbonate may also increase hyperosmolarity and cause a leftward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Patients with DKA should be distinguished from lactic acidosis or alcoholic ketoacidosis. And of course, all of these conditions can occur in the same patient as well. Type 2 diabetes is commonly thought of as insulin resistance. Because it more commonly occurred in adulthood, it was called adult onset diabetes. But in these days, we see many children developing type 2 diabetes as well. In these patients, the plasma insulin concentrations will be high. They have hyperinsulinemia because their target tissues have become resistant with diminished sensitivity to the effects of insulin. Diabetes type 2 is associated with metabolic syndrome, which is a syndrome that involves obesity of the abdomen, insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, increased triglycerides, and hypertension. If type 1 diabetics are at risk for DKA, type 2 diabetics are at risk for hyperosmotic non-ketotic coma. 
These patients have very high blood glucose, often greater than 600. They have just enough insulin to prevent ketoacidosis or ketosis. So we see that relative to DKA, the blood glucose is higher and they can actually be more dehydrated. Patients will become quite hypotensive and the hypoperfusion can lead to lactic acidosis. Cerebral edema can occur, leading to coma and seizures. Thrombosis can occur due to the hypovolemia, the hypotension, and the hyperviscosity of the blood. And the treatment is slow rehydration and small doses of insulin in order to correct the hyperglycemia. Correction can be done over 24 hours in these patients. Hypoglycemia occurs at a serum level of 40 to 50 milligrams per deciliter or below. Diabetics and other patients who have chronic hyperglycemia may experience symptoms of hypoglycemia at higher levels. Symptoms include irritability, seizures, bradycardia, hypotension, and respiratory failure. But in an unconscious patient, it is very, very hard to diagnose hypoglycemia unless you check the blood sugar. That would apply to almost all of our anesthetized patients. If a patient is found to be hypoglycemic, they can be treated with 25 grams of IV dextrose or a milligram of glucagon given intramuscularly. And of course, awake patients could be treated with oral glucose containing foods or beverages. Now we're going to talk about obesity for a few slides. Most definitions of obesity use the body mass index, which is calculated based on weight and height. <coughs> Normal body mass index is 18 and a half up to 25. Below 18 and a half is underweight. From 25 to 30 is overweight. 30 to 40 is obese and greater than 40 is morbidly obese. Patients with obesity are at increased risk for diabetes, coronary disease, sleep apnea, hypertension, hiatal hernia, and GERD. Their increased metabolic rate increases their oxygen demand and their CO2 production. The excess weight may lead to a restrictive lung disease pattern. <clears throat> and this is due to decreased chest wall compliance, as well as cephalad movement of the diaphragm. The FRC in obese patients is far below closing capacity, which causes collapse of alveoli during normal ventilation and VQ mismatch. This is even worse if the patient is placed in the head down position or has to have abdominal insufflation. When treating obese patients in the perioperative period, we should remember that they will have a rapid drop in oxygenation after induction of anesthesia due to increased oxygen consumption and decreased oxygen reserves. These patients may need less dosing of epidurals or spinals by as much as 20 to 25 percent because the epidural fat and distended epidural veins will decrease the amount of volume needed in these spaces. These patients are certainly at increased risk for postoperative respiratory complications and failure. <coughs> we'll stop our recording here, and as always, please contact me with any questions.